Cut B2, this is tape number 25, excerpts from a program featuring Christopher Morley. There's no date on this tape. As I conceive the function of your chairman tonight, he is required to be provocative, to elicit from his colleagues argument or opinion, perhaps even overtaken by candor, opinions they didn't know they had. It's very valuable in the life of the mind when we realize that we rarely know what we are really thinking about. Under the casual exterior preoccupations of the day, the deep current of our imaginative life moves subtle and often unsuspected. The conscious intelligence, which is the least important part of any artist, is often helpless and bewildered in its attempt to understand or utilize that interior flux of dream, intuition, fantasy, call it what you wish, which is the marrow of any distinguished creative excellence. I am tempted to call your attention to a series of three articles by Thomas Wolfe called The Story of a Novel in the three latest issues of the Saturday Review of Literature. There, with the engaging naivete, which is one of Mr. Wolfe's highest qualities, and with a sense of tormented indignation and astonishment, he reveals something of the struggle of a young writer to put the whole feeling of life into literature, to break through into the inside of his own mind. He is writing, of course, about his book of Time and the River, and he describes how after several years' work and more than a million words written, he felt he was just getting started. When, to his chagrin, his editor told him that from the point of view of the publishers, the book was finished. Perhaps Satan himself said that to the creator on the evening of the sixth day. <laughs> At any rate, those articles by Mr. Wolfe are not only of a quite touching frankness, but also perhaps dangerous reading for young writers. I fear lest some may draw from them the quite unwarranted conclusion that if you write a million words, you can fatigue a publisher into accepting them. <laughs> Mr. Wolfe struggles in attempting to reduce his manuscript to tolerable proportion, remind me of something that happened the other day to a scientific friend of mine. A distinguished artist in Mexico City was lately commissioned to do a symbolic mural for a government building. The Mexican Ministry of Art desired the painting to be modernist in style, and the artist decided to attempt in the central panel some graphic suggestion or representation of the theory of relativity. So my mathematical friend in New York received from the artist the other day the following telegram. Send by return wire intelligible statement of Einstein formula. <laughs> <laughs> My friend with heroic patience condensed the necessary equations and assumptions into a Western Union day letter. <laughs> Even under the most savage compression, it cost him over $10. <clears throat> I rather suspect myself that the receiving office in Mexico City may have imagined it to be some sinister diplomatic or capitalistic code. In case anybody should question this, I happen to have in my pocket a copy of that telegram, and I cherish it as a historic document. I have lingered for a moment on Mr. Wolfe because his confessions show in an, in an extreme, almost in a morbid form, the struggle that confronts every artist in his task of catalyzing the emotional and sensory material of life into the soluble stuff of literature. These anxieties and horrors that he so eloquently describes are not unique to himself. They are not even unique to the art of writing. They are a part of every imaginative frenzy from mathematics to manslaughter. In the case of Mr. Wolfe, they are especially severe, I gather, because he prefers to do his thinking on paper. Apparently, he does not edit in his mind before actually dipping the pen. Some others go through their struggle in the lonely cavern of thought, and the result does not come to ink until it has taken form and profile beforehand. The finest statement of this latter method was made by Mr. Gowdy, the great typographer, when he was asked how to design a new font of type. He brooded a while and then said, Why, you think of a letter and draw around it. But whatever method the writer adopts or finds forced upon him, his first problem is to teach himself to think and then to find an audience which is hospitable to thought. Now the concern that occupies my own mind 
since I am told these meetings are frankly, are friendly to frank discussion, is that probably never anywhere at any time was secluded or creative thinking so difficult to achieve as in America today. Every human being is endowed with a limited and infinitely precious stock of attention power. And life today is such that unless the individual is singularly obstinate and cunning, that native and tender innocence of the mind, the artist's birthright, is dissipated or conventionalized by endless, incessant, competitive demand. By newspapers, by electric lights, by telephone, by radio, by moving pictures, by airplane and motor car, and church and school and state, by a thousand appeals, admonitions, and interruptions, the mind is assailed and distracted. When the time comes to throw the whole power of one's will into some superb task, too often we find our faculties grown brittle or callous by repeated overstimulus. We hear a good deal about the agricultural problem of soil erosion, hillsides denuded of fertile topsoil by the action of streams, or great regions of Middle Western richness scoured off by dust storms. Surely not less serious is our problem of mind erosion. The dust storms of daily excitement and of continual triviality can easily blow away the sensitive topsoil of the spirit. The result is a general barren and shallow nervous credulity. Think how many works of genius have been hysterically and prematurely acclaimed in the past 15 years and almost as quickly forgotten. As a practicing critic, I can include myself in the indictment. Sometimes I read in the financial pages about what is called nuisance money. Capital is notoriously timid, and when there are rumors of international trouble, apparently a lot of money skips to and fro, by cable, I suppose, looking for a good, safe breeding place. I am no economist, but I always visualize capital as being not unlike a setting hen. She makes a great fuss when anyone gets near the nest. In the same way, there's an extraordinary lot of nuisance thinking evident nowadays. Shoals and flocks of fashionable or momentary notions, economic or aesthetic, that rush to and fro. They hive suddenly in some magazine or clique, then as suddenly buzz away. I often think of the old fellow described by Hazlitt in one of his essays as having been frightened to death by a ventriloquist. Whole slabs and sections of the American public are in constant danger, it sometimes seems to me, of that same fate. We have many ventriloquists in our public life, in literature, in religion, in politics. By ventriloquists, I mean people who talk in a deep, menacing tone from the emotional entrails rather than from the rational skull. <coughs> one, great, uh, one great ventriloquist was tragically removed by assassination some months ago, but there will always be plenty more. Particularly in the months to come, with political issues paramount, we may expect to hear the deep stomach tones of the professional terrorizer. Now all this is a part of life and has its influence on literature. The books of our time have borne the birthmarks of our own era. It is not to be blamed upon the muse if in an age of hysteria, cynicism and fright, some of her offerings show the stigmata of the general alarm. The magnificent achievements of science have also raised up devils to plague us principalities and powers we have not learned how to control. I mention only one, of such terrific scope that it reaches from the zenith to the pit and is efficient in both regions. The great life-giving and destroying angel, publicity. We have seen only a few days ago in a crowning national humiliation an example of its cruel power. People can be killed with photographs as surely as with guns. The arts are encouraged by reasonable publicity, but they need privacy too. Sudden convulsions of excitement, waves of fashionable acclaim are not always salutary. <coughs> May I recall the humorous interlude of Gertrude Stein? <coughs> the muse herself is wary of little groups, intellectual totems and fetishes, fashionable sensationalism. The dreams, the powers, the tendencies that forward great creation move silently and very far underneath the surface. I remember a scientific report I read in the newspapers some time ago about a rancher in the state of Washington. 
By some oddity of his molecular constitution, he was painfully sensitive to the radio waves that passed through most of us all the time unnoticed. His body acted as a kind of storage battery, and whenever anyone in the neighborhood tuned in on the radio, if it was only a local station, the effect was not much worse than neuralgia. But when a really powerful national hookup was coming through, his condition was deplorable. <laughs> uh, when the White House was on the air, he turned pale, his eyes closed, the veins of his neck stood out like cords, and he usually fell down in convulsion. <laughs> he experimented with a homemade remedy, which was to carry a cane wound with copper wire to act as a kind of lightning conductor. Finally, an engineer, this is the true story, and you'll find it in the proceedings of the American Scientific Society. Finally, an engineer in Tacoma was able to help him. He invented a kind of condenser which goes up the victim's sleeves and down his trouser legs and discharges the coagulated electricity through his boot. <laughs> <coughs> now, that, that homely and apparently irrelevant uh, illustration has its application to the art. Not by sudden spasms of banderlog excitement or novelty does lit literature win new ground, but by subtle, continuous sensibility, by patient and laborious choices, by the onward flow and increase of a whole nation's awareness. The creative sympathies that will help to beget the next great novel are now moving unguessed and unperceived in thousands of us who will be its readers. Perhaps one sound advice for a writer is a line I found not long ago in the instruction booklet for the new Ford car. It says, don't ride the clutch. In other words, keep the narrative moving steadily and without sudden shifts of tempo. It must have continuity. The mind of the reader must be able to flow concurrently and without apprehensions of abrupt change of technique. It's a good motto for government, too. How many businessmen have been worried in the last few years because they could always feel the heavy federal foot just hovering on the pedal. As a final provocative for argument or mutual personal testimony and confession around this table, I suggest one more thought. Literature is not separate from life, but is one of many evidences of living. We can think of it as a form of companionship or of communication or, or, of, or as an attempt, heroic and impossible, to make life stand still long enough to be looked at. But however you describe it, it is subject to the general conditions and humors of the life around it. And when you see a phenomenon which is evident in one department of living, you're likely to find its analogs elsewhere. The outstanding physical phenomenon of our time is an actual change of shape in the mechanics of civilization. The so-called streamline principle, already familiar in all forms of transport, is evident in intellectual activity also. As well as houses and clothes and furniture, so have the arts and even perhaps the religions shown some tendency to simplify, to reduce unnecessary friction, to adopt an outline that will pass with lessened resistance to the opposing medium, whatever that may be. Now the opposing medium in the case of a writer is the mind of the reader. If he can so shape and mold his story that the reader, instead of resisting, collaborates with him, actually does part of the work even unconsciously, that writer has achieved high artistic triumph. And I seem sometimes to discern in the work of some writers who are intuitively ahead of their generation what I like to think is a kind of streamlined dynamics. Virginia Woolf once said, the novelist of the future will take reality for granted. By that, I suppose she meant he won't waste time and energy describing details of furniture or scenery that the reader can well supply, would even prefer to supply from his own mind. Willa Cather said the same thing in a brilliant essay years ago, the novel Des Meubles, that is the novel Unfurnished. This introduces a topic too large and perhaps too <coughs> professional to enter into now in detail. I am suggesting merely that one neglected consideration in the art of writing is this. Not how much can you do for the reader, but how much can you cajole him into doing for you. How much of your book can the reader write for you in his own mind? I coined an aphorism once. Coined is 
too precise a word, I laboriously chopped it out, that one test of any form of expression is the area of silence it covers. I don't know that I could exactly restate what I meant by that, but I can feel, feel its meaning. There can never be any precise testing block or efficiency table for the success of a work of literature because it is published new and different in the mind of every reader. But I can't help thinking that when any art attempts to say or show everything, that art is on the wrong track. 